This episode is brought to you by the Denver Art Museum because you can experience all stars, American artists from the Phillips Collection right now at the museum. Discover some of the best American art from one of the most celebrated collections in the United States. See landmark works by more than 50 artists, including Jackson Pollock, Edward Hopper, Georgia O'Keeffe, Jacob Lawrence, and more. This special exhibition is only on view for a limited time. See it now. Learn more and buy tickets at denverartmuseum.org. That's denverartmuseum.org. Today on CityCast Denver, winter is coming, and no one knows how many migrants will arrive in Denver before spring, or will they'll stay, or if they'll be able to find work, or if they'll get caught up in our overlapping crisis of homelessness. So today we're looking at the tension, uncertainty, and how people are helping out. Then a holiday rom-com shot entirely at DIA. And what's got us and our listeners feeling grateful for Denver this Thanksgiving week? Plus, we are going to put out our very first bonus episode exclusively for CityCast members this week. Thanks to the listener who requested we watch the new Denver season of the reality dating show Married at First Sight. Join today at the link in the show notes to get access for your holiday travels. That link is membership.citycast.fm. Today is Wednesday, November 22nd. I'm Paul Caroli, and here's what Denver's talking about. Welcome back to CityCast Denver, the show about the city that knows exactly how much it is paying in property taxes next year, right? Pop quiz, we all know. No. We all know. <laughs> I know. You know. Do you I read know? all the live blogs over the weekend from the uh, The live blogging session, session yeah. from the- It's a lot of coverage. Special. It's a special wealth of session. knowledge. Yeah. Did you keep up with that, Megan, the, the special session that your, uh, Polis called? Governor oh, no. Polis? Thankfully, there are two other reporters who are on that case. That's so their I their job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I assume I'll figure it out at some point. Um, very complicated, though. And it seems like it only got more complicated this weekend, honestly. I know. I try not to. I just pay it when it comes and am grateful <laughs> that, I don't know. I don't live in a very big place, so mm-hmm. we'll see. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Breeze, Breeze back. I'm you finally can hear here. Her. Welcome back. I'm here. You're for, feeling better. I am. I had two upper respiratory infections and a surgery. This oh, was a geez. little busy, but... I'm better now. So happy to have you back. Thanks. I'm happy to be back. Um, It's Friday. We're in the 5280 Magazine studio, uh, and we have a fantastic returning guest today. She's a reporter with the Denver Post who's talked to us before about uh, great business stories like backyard chicken coops and strip clubs. That's right. But now is taking on a new beat. Uh, Welcome back, Megan Ululani Boynton. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me again. I forgot we did talk to you about eggs and strip clubs. (laughs) Yeah, the cage free eggs and the strip. Yeah, the strip clubs is one of my favorites. You wrote a lot of great business stories. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Wide ranging. I'm excited for you to take on this new thing that we should talk about. um, But I'm a little bit sad that you're not going to be doing business stuff anymore. I know. It's like, you know, you you carve out a niche and a beat, and then it's after a couple of years, it's like, well, on to the next one. But this is going to be a great new adventure. New people. Definitely tackle new stories. So tell us about it. Tell us about it. What's the new thing? Sure. So I am uh, the Denver Post's first neighborhoods reporter. It's a newly created beat um, that's on our public affairs, our our city desk. Um, And essentially we saw a need for this beat because there are so many hyper local neighborhood level issues within um, our own community um, that the stories that we haven't been able to cover quite yet and that we would love to dedicate one person to. And so it looks like uh, I'm going to be that person. Fantastic. That. Fantastic. And we're going to talk about one of those stories right now. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of context. Uh, ever since last December, Denver, like many other cities, has received waves of migrants, many from Venezuela, arriving here looking for help or opportunity or both. Uh, it's nearly 30,000 people so far since last December. Daily arrivals are currently down from their peak in October, um, but our support systems are as strained as ever and our elected officials are scrambling. And it all comes down, at least in this case, to one uh, street corner, uh, Megan, that you reported on um, right. in Athmar Park. And I thought that might be a nice place for us to start. If you could just describe what's been happening in Athmar Park. Sure, definitely. So um, since late last year, last December, uh, there was a migrant shelter that's now closed um, at the Denver Prep Academy on South Zunai Street. Um, And 
initially, uh, I think for about the first six months, things were totally fine. I think some of the neighbors, it's it's right kind of in a residential area, right by a business plaza, um, kind of juxtaposition to a bunch of different houses. Um, and so I, initially, I think things were very quiet. Neighbors noticed that, you know, oh, you know, there's that there's something going on at that, you know, uh, school, old school building. But um, like an empty school building. Yeah, I okay. think so. Denver Community Church owns it now. Um, but it used to be a school building for Denver Prep Academy, I think a gym. Um, mm-hmm. And so they had noticed, oh, there are people going in and out. There must be something happening there. But they weren't quite sure what. Um and there was no problem initially, uh, but I guess as spring turned to summer, neighbors started to notice that um, they were aware now that it was a migrant shelter um, and that after a certain amount of time, I think for it's about 14 days for individual adults, um, you can only stay at the migrant shelter for, you know, a, a city mandated um, time cap. Um, and so after those two weeks, when uh, these different migrants or refugees um, had to leave the building, a lot of them were setting up, you know, encampments nearby because this was the area that they knew. Um, this was, you know, some of the people that they knew too. Um, mm-hmm. And they were starting to kind of spread from the encampment to neighboring properties, you know, private properties, business properties. And this is where one of the residents you quoted, Zeskind, Mm -hmm. Teddy Zeskind, just for a couple of details. For sure. He recounted seeing more litter on the ground, tents on public and private property, and quote, partying at all hours of the night in the parking lot next to Savory Vietnam. Yeah. The Vietnamese restaurant. That was the nearby business plaza across the street. And that was the other source that I had talked to in that neighborhood was the, um, owner of Savory Vietnam and Win, and she was super sympathetic because you know her parents are um Vietnamese refugees so she she understands that struggle but I guess as a business owner it put her into um a weird position because she said that as people started to move into the business plaza property um she was noticing that there was like human feces on the side of her building a bunch of trash that her elderly neighbor had to pick up um she was kind of trying to figure out a way to like um I don't know, prevent trespassing because people were like starting to block like the front of her restaurant. And so I think it it was a good example of um, what a nuanced issue I think this is for Denverites who, you know, like want to be supportive of the city's efforts. But at the same time, we're seeing some, I guess, um, disturbances in their day to day life. And that's kind of what I tried to explore in this story. Um and it was it was a pretty heavy lift because it's like you're you're talking to a bunch of different residents, business owners, city council members, and then of course to the refugees themselves um, about uh, how Denver is handling the migrant crisis um, and seeing it not from the angle of government but from the angle of everyday people who you know are are living nearby or um, I don't I don't know have their daily lives kind of impacted positively or negatively by it. Yeah. 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 I mean, this was in my neighborhood. I live mm-hmm. not far from Athmar Park and I didn't even know that this shelter existed. And I drove by last night. So this is like you're saying the business plaza. Most folks will know uh, Pacific Ocean Marketplace was in there. I think it's called right. Great Wall now. That mm-hmm. was like the big driver. There's a Costco over there um, and all of it is gone now. Like there's no, right. it, there's no encampments. There's no people. I didn't even know that was the building they were using yeah. until I made that connection. Um, but I, I don't know. I really, I, what I gathered from your piece and talking to most of the folks you talked to were empathetic and sympathetic, mm-hmm. but felt a little bit helpless. Like mm-hmm. how this 14 day thing, what happens next? You know what right. I mean? What does a business owner do who, Right. I understand doesn't want to be cleaning up feces and things like that, but also feels empathy for the folks that are all of a sudden just out of the shelter. What is the next step? And I feel like that's where the struggle really lies. Megan, can you explain the 14 day thing? Because that seems like a really important part of this whole dynamic. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, with these migrant shelters, there's four right now throughout Denver, um, but that number can change based on the need from the city. Right now there's four. Um, I can't give specific locations just because I, I could with the Athmar Park one because it's closed now. Hmm. But um, typically the city likes to keep the addresses kind of um, under wraps because, you know, there are so many people who don't want to see migrants um, in, in these cities like Denver. You know uh, so why someone at the city told me they're not giving an address out for why? a shelter? They were like, we don't want walk-ups. Oh, we're trying to keep these spaces. Different from what I heard. That's Is that different? crazy? Yeah. Because I wanted to check because I heard that and I thought, wow, that's like, so you only want the people from the camps because you want to be able to offer the people who are living in camps a space and a shelter because that's the whole, wow. that was the Johnston administration's whole approach. But the side effect of that is if someone just shows up at the shelter, they can't get in. Wow. They can't get at bed. Yeah. I had heard something totally different. So, it, and I think that goes to illustrate though, kind of how 
I don't know, there's a lot of like, there's a lack of information in, in some areas. You know, I feel like a lot of people that I talked to just kind of felt like refugees and neighbors and residents, you know, themselves, they just all kind of felt very in the dark yeah. about, you know, how the city is is handling this. That's how um, I feel. Oh, my yeah. God. But that's so we were talking about the shelters. Yes. So the, the 14 day. Uh, yes. So across these four shelters right now, there's about, I think, 2000 people staying in these shelters right now. Um, you can only stay if you're an individual adult. You can only stay for 14 days. Um, if you're a family, you can stay for 37 days. And the the city was pretty purposeful about that because they're like, we don't want kids on the street if we can help it. Um but as a result, though, after those two weeks and after those 37 days, I mean, these families and— I was going to say, that's something that you also reported on mm -hmm. was farther up on the north side. This hotel sort of off of Spear and I-25, mm -hmm. there were f kids in, in tents oh, because yeah. that 37 days, I'm assuming, was up. Yep. And then you've got families, mm. you know, yeah. in tents. I think that was the most impactful piece of my reporting because we got—I um, I don't speak Spanish fluently, but we were able to hire this great translator, um, and, and our photographer came with. And uh, I had driven by a couple of times to try and get some kind of color, um, and it was just crazy the difference between two, three weeks because when I first started reporting this out, I drove by the uh, motel, and um, there were maybe, maybe 12 tents, probably like, you know, two dozen people. Uh, when I went by last week, there's more than 50 tents. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, the the local councilwoman had counted almost 150 people outside. Oh um, my gosh! Yeah, and when I went with the and it's it's men, it's Sandoval, women, children. Yeah, it's yes, district. it is. Yeah, district yes, one. District one. Um, and and when I was chatting with the translator, I mean, it's just like the stories that I heard from like so many of these of these people. It's just I, it's heartbreaking, like the journeys that yeah. you know people had to take to try and. Um, I don't know, get to Safety. try and build, yeah, build better lives in the U.S. And and now it sounds like the, from talking to, you know, a, a bunch of these refugees, of course, they're like so grateful. They're grateful for the reception. They were really grateful that Mayor Johnston popped by and and talked to them. And, and you know, they they appreciate the shelter. But I think now they're kind of hamstrung because they're they're trying to find work. That's what all of these people want. You know, they're, they're having difficulty getting these work permits. So they can actually get a job that isn't, you know, mowing the grass or nannying or babysitting. Table, right, sort of exactly. Daily labor stuff, yeah. Well, and and the biggest issue right now is that now winter winter is on its way. Oh my gosh! And you have kids out in tents, and um, and you know, adults, and you know, some of the parents are rightfully terrified about you know, like how am I going to keep my kid, you know, hmm. safe through winter? And then you know, others are kind of like, well, you know, I've I've made it this far. If I have to brace through a winter, then I have to do it. <sighs> it. It is clearly a time of great need. The these systems are strained. Uh, the problems are clear. Um, what's what's not clear, as you said earlier, is what what's being done, what the city's doing. You know, city council. This was kind of interesting. You're not the only person to report this, but they recently pooled some leftover money from their office budgets, three hundred thirty thousand dollars to support migrants. That seems really dire to me. Like, has it really come to that point? Like, what else? What what have they done? Right. What, how did it get there? Well, I know that earlier this month too. I think that city council members are trying to balance right now the needs of their constituents. And, um, and, you know, being able to try and take care of, you know, these migrants, um, because it, from talking to different leaders in this city, nobody thinks this is going to slow down anytime soon. I mean, they're going to keep sending the buses up to us. Um, and what's unfortunate for the city is that they, they really don't know when these buses full of people are going to get here. Um, sometimes they'll get a heads up, but usually it's just kind of like a, a bus will drop off sometimes between, you know, a dozen to 90 to um, over 100 people at one time. And the city has to kind of scramble and figure out where to where to shelter these people and, and how to feed them. I know that I think earlier this month um, they held an emergency meeting too hmm. um, to try and discuss, you know, how are we going to handle this again ahead of winter? Um, and I think they they were weighing alternatives. They, they talked about potentially having host families, potentially using places of worship like churches as as shelter in the coming months. Um, and I know that different uh, service providers like uh, Servicios de la Raza, um, they, they're really active on the ground. And I mean, I think everybody right now just needs – it sounds like more resources, more capital to to try and keep offering this, um, especially as, you know, people are going to need more clothes. They're going to need shelter. They're going to need warmth into the future. Mm -hmm. I've seen some reporting. I think you reported the city's already spent $31 million mm -hmm. on migrant response so far. 
And someone, someone said it costs $2 million a week to run these shelters right now. And the shelters are obviously so inadequate. Um, so yeah, obviously it's a huge need. And that must've been why uh, Mayor Mike Johnson was, was going to Washington DC to ask for federal right. support. Um, but anyway, apart from the policy side, there's one other thing that I, I think, Bree, you and I both are really interested to hear um, what you think, Megan, is this, the, how the dialogue around migrants is like overlapping and maybe in conflict with the, the discussion around like our unhoused crisis, right. which, you know, a lot of people looking for hope, opportunity, jobs, you know, looking that's the, the same, same resources, yeah. you know? Yeah. What, how do you see those two things in conflict or like the the discourse diff overlapping or how do you see that from your reporting? So this is something that Councilwoman Chantel Lewis with District 8 was very vocal about, um, because especially because she said that her district is one that's um, historically had to deal with, you know, Poverty as a as a as a district that has um, that has been home to plenty of um, marginalized communities, um, and so sure, I yeah. so her, um, but something that she's been telling her constituents is that although people experiencing homelessness and um, migrants have similar needs, it, they're not the same, and that we shouldn't be pitting, um, right. we shouldn't be pitting one population against the other because their needs are similar, but they're not the same, and she thinks that we can address both without having to make them compete for these resources. But you're right. It does kind of bring up the issue, though, of like, it. I mean, they do all need shelter. You know, they do all need food. They do all need jobs. You know, we I think prior to having these busloads of, of migrants come in starting last year, um, I, I think the, sh the, the city was already kind of trying to figure out how we can handle, you know, our, our growing um, unhoused population. And so now it, it does, I, I agree in reporting. I mean, that was a, a constant theme of, you know, how are, how are we going to handle now two populations that, you know, need the same thing when we were already kind of trying to get a handle on, you know, providing enough resources and uh, shelter for, you know, uh, another population. Hmm. The concentrations of of poverty situation, I think, is reflected so much in where we're seeing folks, right? Like mm -hmm. Chantel's district, District 8, uh, Athmar Park, mm -hmm. my neighborhood, essentially. Um, district 9. District too. 9, which yeah. is a lot of downtown, Globeville. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder what it looks like for the rest of the city and the rest of the council people that are more in the city centers or the, the neighborhoods that aren't typically supporting unhoused folks in general or don't have the services to. I just wonder if this will spread eventually to become something that churches and empty buildings in right. in the middle of the city could start to become shelters for. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. It is, it's so political. Like I was reading in Denverite, like uh, in Aurora, it, they, the Denverite reported that Aurora as a city is basically doing nothing and that nonprofits and like civil civil service groups are stepping up to help migrants. I'm, like I didn't even think about that as an option. Like I, I like that Denver is is doing something. You this know, is what I would have chosen as a voter. Right. And when you when you came across that information, I wasn't. I have to say, Paul, I wasn't surprised because um, that's what I know about Aurora. The nonprofits that are there that are the most prominent are generally the ones that are dealing with refugees and migrant families. That's something that Aurora is really strong with. But I didn't think about the other side of it, which is maybe because politically they're not having that same mm. kind of support. So those hmm. those nonprofits are stepping up as much as they can, you know. Maybe they have more support. Maybe they're getting more funding as a result because people who live in Aurora who would otherwise be paying higher taxes – Interesting. Yeah, Just different know. choices. Yeah. Different choices, way, ways to handle a situation like this. And I will say as like a final note, one thing that I found is that, I mean, your everyday Denverites, Denver is a very progressive city. I think everybody wants to try and figure out a, a way to, uh, you know, several solutions to try and, you know, make sure that everybody's needs are met. Um, but what I've found from talking to different um, folks, especially in, in District 1, kind of near the uh, the one of the current migrant shelters, um, is that everyday citizens feel that the, the government's not working fast enough. They, they don't think that they're doing enough. And so a lot of people are actually organizing on the ground. Um, there's a Facebook group that I joined of over a thousand neighbors and parents in Highlands that are working together to put together donations. They're going to the different shelters and talking to people in encampments and saying, you know, like, what do you need? Um, and they're organizing on Facebook and, you know, saying, hey, does anybody have, you know, this baby powder? Does anybody have this kind of, you know, um, um, food that, you know, this person needs? And they're going and delivering it themselves. And a lot of them feel like they 
they have to because they're like, you know, I think we all realize that we're on a time crunch right now. Winter is coming um, and they want to try and make sure I think the city, the service providers and everyday citizens are realizing, you know, like we all need to work together. We need to work fast. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, Big, complicated conversation. We're going to keep talking about it because it's not going away. Right now, we're going to go for a break and we're going to be back with a segment that uh, answers the question, do you believe in love at first flight? (laughs) (laughs) This episode is brought to you by Denver Botanic Gardens. Because Blossoms of Light is happening now. The annual holiday light show at the gardens runs through January 7th. Don't miss the ever-changing display of light and color with a massive animated tunnel of lights, illuminated water features, and lightscapes synchronized to music, plus holiday treats and warm drinks for purchase. This show is illuminated 100% with LED lights because Blossoms of Light aligns with the garden's core value of sustainability. CNN ranked Blossoms of Light as one of the top places to see lights in the country. Tickets are on sale now, so get yours today at botanicgardens.org. How did they score botanicgardens.org? Were they like the first botanic gardens to have a website? That's botanicgardens.org. All right, and we're back. We got a fun topic here for this next segment. Uh, Lots of folks, myself included, will be traveling for Thanksgiving this week. That means lots of time at Denver International Airport, a.k.a. DIA, DIA, a.k.a. D-E-N. Oh, yes, D-E-N. That's its official airport code. Yeah. That's right. should probably say that. No one else does. Nobody no, we does. only use DIA, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, we just watched this really funny little romantic comedy movie that United <laughs> Airlines just put out. Uh, they shot it all at DIA, and they did it, uh, according to United Airlines spokesperson Russell Carlton, to help people, quote, simplify and enjoy the journey. So... Uh, <laughs> Did you all enjoy the journey of this rom-com? I mean, it's it's definitely a Hallmarkian experience. Absolutely. You know what I mean? The little sparkles and little elf ears and all the United employees <laughs> yeah, is a like nice touch. The the huffy business lady, you know, like the huffy lady who's in a hurry. Who's, Famed astronomer. Yeah. Right, right. What did she say? <laughs> Miss she says, Elto. <laughs> and she says she's, uh, she, she's not married because she has a cr- job with crazy hours. She's just an, ast- Which does an it? astronomer. It's, it is a quirky job. That's like a fun romantic comedy job. It's to totally a romantic comedy job. Yeah. And then there's the like unlikely candidate man who she falls in love with. And her yeah. love is the sky. But her love is truly the sky. <laughs> love, the sky. Maybe I just need to say, Mom, Dad, my life partner is the sky. I love the sky. Is that what you asked? I asked if you were checking that. The meet cute. Take us the through meet the meet cute. cute yeah, so, this is important. People are going to want to know. So she's like going through the airport. She's in a hurry. Concourse she's, A. B. Did you clock it? I didn't. I I don't know the airport that well. She looks so like good and calm walking through that That's airport how too. I felt Pan too. to me, sprinting to my flight. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> well, she's so she's just wandering, listening to the carolers, and this gentleman runs right into her, spills her gingerbread latte all over her right white sweater. Mm-hmm. Devastating. Gives her a real half-assed apology, hands her some napkins, and goes on his way. Carolers at DIA? I know. That was my first question. Never seen that. I I wouldn't be surprised. I so they have them at Cherry Creek Mall, but they're dressed as like Victorian era carolers, which I really like. Oh, that's nice. So if DIA is gonna do it, I would say hire those people. Um but it yes, so there's that (laughs) the holiday magic happening. She's watching the carolers and then she gets on the plane and she sees a portly fellow wearing red with a big white beard. Right. Distracts her. Yeah. Tim Allen. (laughs) <laughs> looking Santa Claus guy gets on the plane. The Again, United employees all have uh, little elf, elf ears. ears. It's yeah. like that, that holiday magic. And then she sits down and the gentleman next to her on the the pimpest flight I've ever seen. That's, I've never been on a United flight that look and that has a bed. Oh, and it had like fold out beds. They was, were bringing custom ice cream. You make your own ice cream Sundays. It was I was like, which flight are they on? Where flight. are they flying? Like... She's a famed think. astronomer. So <laughs> yeah. has, I don't think like, ever air travel has ever been like that. For no, anyone. that was like the opposite of the quintessential holiday travel experience where you're like smashed up against somebody else <laughs> who's being super rude or you're me and I have a baby. You know? uh, the baby. 
the fact that they bond their first moment of like maybe liking each other is that they both mutually recognize there's a baby on the flight and, and they instead love it of, and start cooing yeah, instead at of, it like <laughs> hating instead it. of being pissed about it which most people are that was yeah. probably the most unrealistic part of the movie agreed <laughs> I agreed. Couldn't, couldn't agree Santa's but be- more believable <laughs> before that though he's doing all these annoying things next to her which yes. Megan you were like if this man was if doing man any of these ever, things next to me like I'd be doing the group sit-ups chat, in his seat like, <laughs> Yes. Help get me off the spilled plate. wine on her. Like it was just like, are you kidding me? My man spilled no. two drinks on her in two a drinks. five minute movie. It take more than a cooing baby for me to get over the frustration yes. that I have for this man. I mean, he's handsome. We'll give him that. So total hunk. Here's your ice cream sundae. I promise, Elle, I will not spill a drop of this. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, my sweater is already ruined, so I guess it doesn't really matter anymore, Mister. Um, <laughs> Sorry, um, I don't know your name. Uh, Sam K. Young. But my friends call me by my initials. Sky. I love the sky. What? What? So they they have all these hilarious little moments all throughout their flight where he's kind of being annoying. And then the baby is crying. They both go, oh my God, they love the baby. They look at each other like, oh, we love each other. And then (laughs) fast forward a year later, they're on a flight to... Honolulu, Hawaii, and my homeland. Your homeland. <laughs> yeah, we have to talk about that. Shout out. that. I mean, I know that that's like a controversial thing in Hawaii. Like it feels attracting like a weird tourism, place to be going right now, especially this year. I don't yeah, know. there's so much. So Oahu is fine. There's always like a historic conversation around like the over tourism of sure. Hawaii. If they were on a flight to Maui, that would be controversial I think I mean a trip to Honolulu though I feel like that's pretty standard fine. Okay. I was there over okay. the summer I thought I'm that was glad interesting. you were here for that I was, <laughs> that was gonna bother me all day you guys both look at me <laughs> <laughs> well you know you I have expertise in this no, area for sure um, um, speaking of your expertise I want to ask you about United and why they oh, do yeah. this why this exists because this guy this Carlton guy said mm-hmm. he said shooting the holiday movie in Denver was an opportunity for United to feature one of its fastest growing hubs where it has invested nearly a billion dollars um, they've got new gates, new clubs, and a new check-in lobby in Denver. Mm-hmm. So, Den, D-I-A, um, <laughs> whatever they want us to call it, um, is United's most important hub next to Chicago, which is its headquarters. Oh. Um, it's, I mean, it's it's one of both Southwest and United are vying to be number one at. Denver International. Um, Southwest is our number two um, as far as like largest carrier goes. And I think that United really wants to be Denver's hometown airline. But you guys might notice there's like a little bit of like a an airline's war happening between them because it's like you'll drive down. Um, I don't know. You're driving down through uh, Denver. You're, you're downtown. You look up at the billboards. You know, the one I'm talking about that has like Casa Bonita. It's right across from Meow Wolf. Uh-huh. They're it's used on yeah. Yeah. coming into exactly. to town. Yeah. So sometimes they'll have like advertisements from Southwest about like, oh, you could be flying here. It's um, like fly to KC. We'll right. your bags. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <Yep>. So <laughs> it's, there is an active... There's an active so uh, interesting. battle between the two airlines to be Denver's hometown airline because neither one of them are ever going to re like relocate their headquarters here because um, Southwest is based out of Dallas, um, United is in Chicago. Those are both like two very important hubs. Um, so I, I doubt they'll ever move, move their here. headquarters here. But they know that this is a city with like such a huge presence in the airline industry. And I mean, Frontier is based here, but nobody's like, I feel like Denver is not <laughs> that's like, kind of that's a, my that's kind of a sad like, story like, too. <laughs> Just like, that's not. Well, but this spirit is, is pulling out. Which is interesting you're saying that because I'm just thinking more and more, Paul, you know, we think about the long-term legacy of Denver and this was a, this was a Federico Pena project. Absolutely. Mayor yeah. um, Pena many decades ago said, this is what Denver could be. And I imagine I was a kid, so I wasn't really super aware of the politics of it. He just had the foresight to see something as big as this. And now we have two major carriers competing over being the biggest airline here. And that means United building basically its own airport onto oh, yeah. it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like a new check-in, everything. And I yeah, don't know. Doing, I guess if you're going to spend that kind of money, you're going to spend some big bucks on a really nice advertising campaign. And boy, it is nice. And it they, nice. I know. I really wanted to. I want to go in the United Club. I saw our influencer friend Amanda Bittner went in it, and it oh, looked yeah? so Good for her. nice. Good for mm-hmm. her. Maybe you could have your own little meet cute. You could meet meet up with Amanda. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Where, is, is, is DIA romantic? That's what I want to ask. Is DIA a romantic place? 
I mean, it's romantic if you enjoy high cortisol levels, I guess, if you like to get I know. I was like, um, and also as a person in a relationship, it just like, it's just a stress point because you're Mm -hmm. traveling with your family and like, my husband does things one way, I do things another Mm -hmm. way. And then in the middle of it, we have a two-year-old who's going insane. And so, no, it's not Mm. a romantic, I want it to be. I do think it's a classic place that where people are like- Oh, I'd love to meet somebody on a well, plane where else next are you? So they are playing into the trope that I think I've heard a lot of my girlfriends talk about. And we don't yeah, have a, a lot of these natural environments anymore where we cross each other's paths as much hmm. because we're on our phones, like when we're mm-hmm. waiting in line somewhere. But if you're at the airport, sometimes you're there for a couple hours. You may be on yeah. your phone, but you might have more of a chance of meeting a stranger, you know? So I could see, I think genius marketing on their part. The production was really good. The too, production I'll say. was really nice. So at the end, I don't know if we said this, they get married. Yes. The couple gets married. They're on the, the fast forward is a year later. They're on their honeymoon. Um, my only complaint about the production was they used a ripoff of uh, Run DMC's <laughs> Christmas and Hollis at the end, instead of just paying the money. To play Christmas and Hollis at the end, which is what they should have done. They should so. have had the guys in the movie at the end oh, serenading that been- our heroes. Amazing. As it happens on every United flight. <laughs> well, right. you don't know. I mean, around in their seats. I mean, <laughs> if you're getting an ice cream bar brought over to your seat, maybe Run DMC is behind you performing Christmas and Hollis. I'm just saying. So. Christmas and Hollis is the name of the track? Yeah. All right, it's we're a classic. Gonna... It's a holiday. Cla- you know me and my Christmas music. It's a holiday classic. <laughs> well, we're going to go out for one more break. Uh, hear a little bit of Run DMC's Christmas and Hollis. And then we'll be back with Gratitudes for Amazing. Thanksgiving. Great. Great, great. 24th on Hollis Avenue, the dark. When I seen a man chilling with his dog in the park, I approached him very slowly with my heart full of fear. Looked at his dog, oh my god, a ill reindeer. But then I was really going to man at a beer and a bag full of people. Um, all right, and we're back. Uh, here we are, our last, last segment before the big long Thanksgiving break. Um, we thought we'd do a little something different this time instead of wins and fails, which we'll be back next week. Um, we're gonna do uh, Denver gratitudes. Just what are, what are we grateful for about Denver this year? Um, so we put a call out to you all, the listeners. We got a few um, really, really nice uh, responses, and we all brought one. Yeah. Right. How should we start? Who wants to start? You, you, you <laughs> I'll start. Sure. You go, sure. Go sure. It. Um, I mean, mine is is partially the universal preschool program and the kindergarten programs. As a parent now in that age group, um, with a kid in that age group, I am understanding the value of it so much more and how important it is that we have these opportunities. And I also just want to give gratitude to um, my son goes to a wonderful school and it has been just life changing for him to have this social space where he's just like totally, totally embraced as like people know my husband's a musician. And so mm-hmm. my son um, just plays musician all day. That's his pretend. His pretend <laughs> default is he's on, he goes, mom, I'm on a stage. Mom, I'm on a stage. And then he goes, nice to meet you. Hello. <laughs> this is his new thing. And then he goes into, he either plays uh, Thunderstruck by ACDC or sings Sick. We Are the Champions by Queen. Those Great are the choices. two songs he knows like all the yeah. words to. But at his school, they like love that about him. <laughs> and so I just want to give out a shout out to his teachers, Miss B, Miss Shaniqua, Miss Ellie. They're so lovely and they just make me feel so good about sending my son somewhere where they think they embrace every part of this person. So, and shout out to all the kindergarten and preschool teachers and folks in early learning. It's a really amazing job and I'm just so grateful that you do it. There are toughest soldiers. Oh man. <laughs> A lot of, especially we're in potty training era. So I really, really oh, respect speed. those. Those <laughs> They got a room full of kids figuring it out. So Paul, what about you? Um, yeah. Okay. I'll go, I'll go next. Um, so mine, there's the, it's a little, going to be a little explicit, but I just think it's, um, you know, this is the year where we elected a mayor that gives a shit. Like, I think say what you will about Mayor Mike Johnston. Uh, he, he is really focused and spent a lot of time and effort and gotten a lot of money together to um, attack this unhoused crisis we've got in Denver that we all agree is the number one issue. And after 12 years of Hancock increasingly clearly not, not give interested. that much of a shit yeah. to have a mayor give a shit and bring people together you know, maybe there's some some fractiousness happening I mean, now, but I generally think the energy has still been excellent. I agree. It's, it's not without its challenges. And I understand that nobody is going to do this perfectly. And I think that's the frustrating part for, um, you know, we interact with city officials a lot on this show and most of them really care and they genuinely are trying the best that they can. And I think that, um, 
one thing that Mayor Mike Johnson has really done is just shown his face. And that's something we didn't see Hancock do in these experiences. She, you know, he should like when uh, Councilwoman Lewis called him and said, what is going on with this? I'm down at this camp. He shows up. He he really responds. And so I, I, I'm with you, Paul. I think I think we're going to see how he continues to back up those actions. But I appreciate that we have a mayor and a city council that is willing to show their faces in the moment that these things are happening. Yeah. I'm with you. I mean, we'll see what happens next year, but um, that's that's something from this year that I was definitely grateful for, for sure. Let's go for one from a listener. <laughs> we'll save yours for later, Megan. Uh, <laughs> so this one comes to us from Patrick from Southeast Denver. It's short. Patrick says, sending my gratitude to Denver's amazing healthcare. I'm a cancer survivor and oh. owe my life to the staff at Colorado Blood Cancer Institute. Oh, Patrick, congratulations on being a survivor also. That's incredible, but... Um, if you've ever been through a cancer situation with yourself or a family member, it's grueling and daunting. And when you have supportive healthcare folks around you, that's awesome. That's so good to hear. That is nice to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, shout out to Colorado Blood Cancer Institute and thanks to Patrick for, uh, for writing yeah, in. sharing that with us. Uh, let's go one more from a listener. Hey, CityCast. This is Sarah Satori from Bear Valley. And this year I'm grateful for all the Denver workers who've gone on strike. Uh, it's been an incredible year watching workers find their voice, whether it's Starbucks, UAW, and, you know, I think workers everywhere are a little stronger when brave workers walk off the job and demand what they deserve. So thanks to all the workers who've been brave and walked those picket lines. She yes. makes a great point. I mean, there has been so much union and labor and collective action activity over the past year. Um, as a reporter, I, I've been actually kind of astounded. I feel like... It, it, Maybe because my beat didn't intersect quite as much um, at my last job, I, I maybe I wasn't paying attention as much, but it does feel to me like there's been more of a trend toward collective bargaining across industries um, totally. over the past year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I did choose this one for a specific reason, Bree, and that is Starbucks. Uh, you <laughs> you have a relationship with Starbucks. The listeners know this. I know. <laughs> we there The Starbucks employees, I got a press release last week. Apparently there was a big strike, a yes. nationwide strike. Yes. Where are you at with the company right now? I'm going there like once every three weeks. Hmm. When we Usually when I leave the house to go to come into the office, I hmm. do. But I have cut my consumption down by about 80%. Hmm. I would say. And I am excited that the building that we're in here at 5280, beautiful 5280 Magazine Studios, is getting a – what's the place called, Megan? Queen City Coffee Collective. We're getting a Queen City Coffee Collective, and then we can just go there. I am super excited about I'm that. I'm so excited. But I also just want to uh, – I like that this listener pointed out the bravery because it's one thing to talk about striking. And I understand the scariness – of taking that step to walk away from your job, especially for hourly folks, that is no joke. You are making a decision in that moment for the hopefully a better future. But sometimes you don't have the backing of the union support that you need for monetary. I mean, that's a big thing to do. And again, shout out to all these folks that are working hourly wages. It's been a long time since I've had that kind of job. And I know the stress, uh, but I know that stress. Salary workers, we think a little differently about our paychecks. And so these folks putting their necks out. And Paul, I feel like we started this year with this conversation. Yeah. Were we on the picket lines in, was it January? Are you talking about King Supers? Yes. I think that might have been last year. Was January? that even last year? I, it's been, I, it's, it's been, been a ongoing. constant story. I mean, we talked about the the Mercury Cafe, of course. King the Supers. Workers there. Hmm. Uh, healthcare workers. Oh, the airlines workers. Kaiser Permanente. Yeah. Denver Post were unionized. And totally. It's we finally just reached an agreement um, for raises. That's amazing. A couple of months ago. Right. So it's across, right. it's across industries. Uh, all right, Megan, I think it's your turn. Let's all hear right. your gratitude. Okay. I am thankful for um, the fact that Denver is the first city. It actually kind of ties in nicely with our oh. conversation earlier. Uh, it's the first city where I've been able to actually um, – connect with a part of my culture and that this is a place with Hawaiian restaurants. This is a place with like huh. Asian grocery stores that actually serve like Hawaiian foods. And like when my mom came to visit, she gets like so excited because we're like, oh, we can go and get some like frozen poi. And like, you know, we can, we have all like, the ingredients that we need. Um, and there's like a, a small but mighty Hawaiian community in like the surrounding Denver area. And so um, I, that is something that I've been looking for in a city. I mean, you know, I'm from New Orleans and I've lived in Phoenix and DC and um, Denver is um, definitely the the city thus far that has had like the biggest like Hawaiian presence that's allowed me to um, 
I don't know, on a daily basis, like kind of connect with um, my maternal culture. And oh, it's been really, really enjoyable. Because you I did a that. story. We talked about your story recently where you did the story on the sort of proliferation of Hawaiian restaurants here. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, really that love that year. you tied in all of that is like, it's not just about the food. It's about people meeting each other and connecting over that. Yeah. And that story actually led me to like the the whole Hawaiian community here reached out and they were like, oh my gosh, like, you know, <laughs> like a young, like, you know, a young Hawaiian reporter at the Denver Post, what? And I got invited to like a Denver Wahines club, which is like um, Hawaiian for women. Um, and so it was like, I, I got to meet a bunch of like women from Hawaii that are like on the the continent now. And so it's, it's been nice. Um, That's awesome. I don't know, to have like aunties and uncles um, that are like, they're not real aunts and uncles, but that's what yeah, we call them. Yeah. And aunties and uncles, like, you know, in, in the surrounding area who will, like, go and get lunch with me and, like, we'll just chat. And I don't know. It's great. When you can feel like home somewhere else, yeah. it's really nice. That oh. is really nice. That's a great one. I know. I was like, oh, thanks, guys. It's so <laughs> sweet to hear. I love um, to hear that. All right. We got one more from a listener here. We'll, we'll go out on this one. Hey, CityCast. This is Aaron from Wash Park. Um, there are so many things I'm grateful for about Denver, um, like how welcoming people are, um, how there aren't that many bugs. But the biggest thing I'm grateful for is that there is amazing weather all four seasons. There are very few places on Earth like that, I feel like, um, and just that each season is more beautiful than the last, you know, like, Winter hiking season is over, just in time for wildflowers, just in time for um, all these beautiful um, grassy areas. Yeah, it's just amazing. There's always something to do no matter what month. So, yeah, and I'm grateful for you guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Oh, so cute. Did you say no little li- minimal bugs? Minimal bugs. Yeah. <laughs> I have heard this. It's – are we – You've lived in other climates. Humidity, you are way I assume, more is bug like, free okay. than like New Orleans or like my boyfriend's from Minnesota. And I think that we're both states are in a competition for who has the largest mosquitoes. So, <laughs> yeah, so Denver, Denver, definitely you guys are, are less buggy than huh. other places. How about that? Put our, I, yeah. our hats on that. <laughs> I mean, I know less I've been buggy. enjoying that my whole life, not realizing that was really a blessing. Mm-hmm. Huh. But I do like that's a nice, that was a nice call out to the seasons. Oh, totally. Why yeah. we want to live here. Do either of you have stuff you're looking forward to about the winter? Some stuff that you've been waiting to do? Snowboarding. Snowboarding. I just got my icon pass. Ah, oh, good for you. Good just, for you. I'm just ready to go to the mall and see all the Christmas decorations. See the carolers. And the carolers. And, and the big trees. And, and their Victorian outfits. Oh, <laughs> it's so cute. I can't wait. Uh, all right. Well, th- this has been such a fun show. I mean, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Bree, yeah. Megan, thanks for joining me. Great. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, happy you guys. Happy Thanksgiving. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. Our producers this week were me, Paul Caroli, Olivia Jewell Love, and Lizzie Goldsmith. Peyton Garcia writes our morning newsletter, Hey Denver. Bree Davies is our host. Our music is by Los Mocachetes, with additional mixing by Tyler Lindgren. If you haven't already, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at CityCast Denver, and tell the carolers at DIA about us next time you see them. You can sign up for our daily newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. And don't forget, join as a member today to get access to our very first bonus episode exclusively for CityCast Denver members. That URL that you need is membership.citycast.fm. See you after the holiday. And this is your pilot Pete speaking. We'd like to welcome aboard newlyweds Sam K. Young and famed astronomer Miss L. Toe. Happy honeymoon, you two. Now just sit back, relax, and enjoy our flight to Honolulu.